guys. Good morning. Uh, what I will be doing now is, before we start the lecture, I'll return the graded project phase one to each team. Alright, uh, so I'll call the team name and then, yeah, collect it. Mm, I think we kind of get confused between team name and project name sometimes. So, if I call your project name, that's what it is. So. And food bus. Project X. Data Inceptionist. Squad. Team squad. Clan of Noobs. Um, fully functional. 
But second normal form is not that commonly desired. Mostly we want things to be in third normal form. In third normal form, the way we test it is um, the schema should not have a non-key attribute functionally determined by another non-key attribute, if you recall from uh, the very short example last time. So to solve this problem, if we have a schema that's not in third normal form we want it to be, we simply have to decompose and create a relation that includes the non-key attributes and functionally determines other non-key attributes. Okay. So um, for your project phase two, you are expected to refine um, your schemas into the third normal form. Okay. So you will want to talk about your reasoning, what you identify the functional dependencies of, and how what you did, what approaches you took to make it into the third normal form. Okay. Then remember we say when we list first normal form, second normal form, third normal form, and boy scout normal form, we say it's increasingly what? It's getting more and more strict or restrictive, right? So the strictest one we want to talk about today is voice cop form, right? Um, I think on the slides I made these bullet points, but I think it was better if you use numbering because then we can map it to the third normal form we were talking about before. So the definition for a boy's cop normal form, uh, which we normally in short just call it BCNF, is that a relation R with functional dependencies F is in boys count normal form if for all of the X determining A in the closure is satisfied either the first one or the second one. So the first one being A belongs to X, which we have seen before, and we call this trivial. Right? And the second one will be X contains a key for R. And because X contains a key, X can be a super key. So when we compare this to the definition of third normal form, what can you observe? What's the only difference they have? Can okay, you recall how many rules are in the definition for third normal form? Seems like three, right? There were another one right after the second one. Remember which one it is? A being part of the key. Remember? Everyone looks so blank. But anyway, um, that one is allowing more possibility for a schema to be in the. Right? But this is voice part normal form, so it doesn't allow that. So it's actually stricter because these are or, not in. So for voice part normal form, if either of this is true, then it's voice part normal form. So intuitively, we say the only non-trivial dependencies are those in a key okay, that determines some attributes. So when you think about boys count normal form, it's either um, having this trivial functional dependencies or keys determining other non-key So in interpretation, or the way you can think about it, is each tuple can be seen as an entity or a relationship identify by a key and describe attributes. Right? It's just a way of thinking about it. So if you can take a look at the figure here. We use the ovals to denote attributes, which is like what we did in the ER diagram. And here, don't get confused between these and the arrows in the ER diagram. These are the arcs, and it's showing the functional dependencies. So if a schema is seen boys count normal form, the attributes can be shown this way. So here is the key, and only the key can determine something else. All right? And this doesn't have to be single attribute, it can also be set of attributes, but this one has to include key. So that's the idea of voice So let's take, um, maybe until now you're still a little bit confused, so let's take a really quick look at an example to see whether it is in voice So for a voice count normal form, we said it ensures that no redundancy at all can be detected using functional dependency. What do we mean by that? If you take a look at this example, and we have one value missing here, right? The question mark, we don't know the value there. So if we say, given x determines a, and we go back to look at this instance, can we figure out what the value for the question mark is? 
if x, this attribute, determines this attribute. It's also a, right? Because here we have x corresponding to a, so here it should be the same, all right? So given this function dependency, we know the value for the question mark missing there is also a. So now we figure out until this part, then is this instance in um, voice continuity? Note that we haven't said who will be the key. All right. So if you take a look at this example, because we say, let's assume we want this to be in voice continuity. And now we have a functional dependency right here. And if this is in voice count normal form, this functional dependency has to either satisfy the first rule in the voice count normal form definition or the second rule, right? So what is the first one? A belonging part of X. But as we can see right here, A is definitely distinct from X, all right? So we don't consider the first rule. And how about the second one? The second one is saying X is the key, correct? So let's assume x will be the key, all right? So what will happen if x is the key? Then y is also a non-key attribute, so x should be able to determine y as well, right? Then what does this mean? They have x right here, two rows, have the same value for key, so y1 should be equal to y2, right? Then, what do we learn from here? These two tuples are exact same. Then, we are storing redundancy, all right? So this is actually not in voice cut normal form. So, how do we fix it, you think will make it voice cut normal form? If we can discard here, all right? And which one you think picking the key gives it the possibility of becoming voice continuous? Yeah, if we pick Y, right? Because it's okay for a key to have all the other values the same. Right? Are you guys following? So this one is not in voice continuous. Um, We'll work on more of the examples of looking at is this in voice on normal form or third normal form or second normal form later on. But today I want to stop here for all the all of the normal forms. Okay? So for your project, you don't have to really go all the way to voice count normal form, just until third normal form will be fine. Voice count normal form is definitely really desired, but sometimes it's not realistic to achieve. So Remember when we were talking about all the kinds of normal forms before, we were saying what should we do to make it in a normal form. There is one way that we can break down the, the relations, and we call it the, um, decomposition, right? Sometimes you have a really big table that has so many attributes, and maybe that causes a lot of problem that doesn't fit a normal form. In order to achieve such a certain normal form, we can decompose them in some ways, right? But a lot of times, not every kind of decomposing is correct or good. So later, um, I want to talk about um, decomposition. Okay, how to achieve a good decomposition. So here we call it the properties of decomposition. It's actually important to check that a decomposition. Um, I'm spelling more one more x, so you can take that out. It is important to check that a decomposition does not introduce new problems. Right. So, as we were discussing before, when we talked about different kinds of normal form, we thought about, okay, this might be not so ideal, this, maybe it will create more problems. So, when we decompose relations, we should check whether the decomposition we did, first of all, allows us to recover the original relation. You don't want to make decomposition and actually lose information, right? or actually cause wrong information when you recover it back. And the second one is, remember, at the very beginning of learning about your diagram design, oh, no, 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 like just basically um, uh, design of the relations, the schemas, 
we were also thinking about, in some application, we have certain types of integrity constraints, okay? different scenarios with a different kind of concerns. So you should also think about whether the composition you do will allow you to check the in integrity constraint. Okay? You don't want it to be like, um, you design in such a way that you decompose it, but you lose the way of checking whether the in integrity constraints still hold. So there are two types of um, decomposition, and actually each of them takes care of each of these. So the first one is lossless, lossless join. This kind of decomposition, the definition, helps us to make sure uh, the decomposition we do can recover to the original condition. And the second type is we call it dependency preserving. Okay. So dependency preserving decomposition allows us to check the integrity construct. Okay. So later on we want to talk about these two types of decomposition and how we can check whether the decomposition we do satisfy. So in the rest of the slides today, I think like here and there I've made some typos. So bear with me, I'll tell you where I made them and you can fix them. Okay, so the first one is lossless joint decomposition. So the, de um, the definition of it is a decomposition of R, R we, we say it's a relation, right? Into two schemas with attribute set X and Y is said to be a lossless joint decomposition with respect to F which are the set of functional dependencies, right? For every instance R, so these are the subsets of the whole table, right? Every instance R that satisfies the dependency in F. If the projection on the instance R taking a natural join of the instance Y, no, 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 instance R's projection of Y is back to the R. I'll talk about what this means. So imagine we have a schema okay, that has a lot of attributes, and when we decompose it, because we have some concern, it's not in a certain normal form, and we um, break it down, decompose it into set X and set Y. Okay? So both X and Y are from the original attribute sets. Then we want to check whether such decomposition is lossless join. How, what we can do is we take the instance okay, with the data in there, and we first take a projection on x set of x um, attributes, all right? And we also take a projection on the instance with attributes in the y set. Okay, we take a natural join of them, which you should be familiar. Yeah. R is the instance, and x are saying which attributes to take out. Remember, for the subscript. Okay. Okay. So we take a natural join of them. If they satisfy lossless join, that would be go back to the original instance. Okay. So in other words, we can recover the original relation from the decomposed relations. But so you can see right here. Remember, we had examples before. We didn't only decompose into just two subrelations. So this one actually, you can infer it into more than two decomposed um, relations. Okay. So that's what the next slide I want to say. And just simply cross out these two lines. I was going to talk about another idea, but I think it will make you really confused. So cross them out. Um, but just basically remember, the definition we had can easily be extended to cover a decomposition of R into more than two relations. But for the sake of understanding the concept of lossless join, in today's example, we'll only talk about when you decompose them into two. Right. So let's take a, take a look at an example and see whether the decomposition is in lossless joint. So here is the example we want to take a look at. So we have this original 
schema with the instance R. All right? So the schema is SPD. Okay? Let's say we decompose it into SP and PD. Let's not think about who's the primary key first. Okay? For losses joint, we ignore that for now. So we decompose it into SP and PD, and very easily you can see we just kind of slice them, right? Take these two columns, and that's this one. So that's why we put the attributes here, right? And then the other as well. So because we want to check whether it is in lossless joint, remember in the last slide we say we just basically take a natural joint of those two, okay? So the result of taking a natural joint of those two is actually right here, okay? Because when taking a natural joint, what does it do? When we take a natural joint, it finds the field with the same name, right? So they have the same name as P, so it will actually repeat it. If it's both P1, then it has another possibility of D being D3, if it's, it's right? So it's adding more of the tuples right here. So here, you don't have to write down the whole sentence, but it's basically saying these two are created that were actually not in the original data, <coughs> correct? So this means when we recover it back, it's actually not maintaining the real information, okay? So even though this is creating more information, instead of losing information, we call this lossy, right? As long as it doesn't recover correctly, completely correctly back, it's lossy. Doesn't matter losing it or adding redundancy. So if this happens after checking it, we know this is not equal to the original little r anymore, then this one is not lossless join decomposition, okay? So we have a couple of um, observations and theorems for lossless join decomposition. Think about <coughs> the theorem here. So we can say, I kind of repeat it here, but uh, we have been using big R and big F for the same purpose the whole time. So let R be a relation and F be a set of functional dependencies that hold over R, right? And the decomposition of R into relations with attribute sets R1 and R2 is lossless if, I think I wrote is, right, so you can change that, if and only if the closure contains either, either R1 taking intersection with R2 determines R1 or R1 taking intersection with R2 determines R2. So we can work on this example really quickly later. But this is a really easy rule of thumb for you to check whether um, the decomposition is lossless join instead of going through what we were doing, taking an natural join. So this is a quicker test. So why does this make sense? Let's take a look at the example in the next slide. So, So now we have, if you recall, we have an hourly employee example a few lectures ago. So remember we were saying we found that rating determines the hourly wages at that lecture. So because we don't want this to be kind of bothering us and we think it's not necessary to store them all in the one table, we decompose them. Okay. So remember uh, when we had that, let me write this down. You remember when we are talking about functional dependency, we like to use just single letter to denote each attribute, right? So here I will use S and Of the schema right And we know rating determines our wages. So right here, I also missed a few things. The first thing being SSN is the primary key. Okay, on your slides, not underlined, but please underline here. 
So we have this functional dependency where rating determines hourly wages. So if we want, let's say we want the table to be in third normal form. Do you think this will be in third normal form if we have such functional dependencies? No, right? Because first of all, if we think about the first rule, W definitely not part of R, right? Wage is definitely not part of the rating. And we think about the second rule, right here it has to be the key, and rating is not the key, all right? So that's why this is violating third normal form um, for this reason, for the R determinant W. Okay. So that's why we decompose it into these two. And I also missed um, SSN being the primary key for the left table and rating being the primary key for the right table. Okay. So if we do this decomposition, do you think it's lost this wrong? Let's check it in two ways. The first way being we use the theorem to think about it. Okay. If we do a natural join here, do you think it will perfectly recover to the original one? Or it's too hard to think of a natural joint here, right? Okay, so let's think about it in the way that we learned about the quick checking okay, in the previous slide. So the pre uh, quick checking is saying the original R, um, let's not get confused with the R of that, right? So here, the R I say will be for the instance for the schema, okay? So we decompose it into two parts. The first being R1, the right side being R2. Okay. So R, R has all these <coughs> attributes. What does R1 have? It has S, N, L, H. And this one, you have R, correct? So, if you could go back to take a look at how we can do a quick check in theory 3, basically saying, if we view these as sets, or they're already sets, but I'll just put on curly braces to make it a bit clearer. So if we think of them as sets, here being R1, here being R2, okay, taking intersection, what would the um, result be? This one. Okay? And this one, does it determine either R1 or R2? So, yeah, this is really confusing. This is the attribute, okay? This is the decomposed schema. Alright. I think I'll put. Okay, for schema, I'll put them both. So the thick one being um, the one saying schema, but the thin one, we just say is the attribute. Okay? So because of this, we take an intersection of it, and it becomes R, and we know it can determine the R to schema, so that in theorem 3, it's correct. So it's a loss of schema. Okay? So if this is not so intuitive to think about, this is just a quick check, but the more intuitive way is really to think about how this will be when you take a natural joint between these two and whether that will completely match here. Right? So if we do a really quick natural joint, you can see the rating 8, 5. So here if we just append it, right? So 8 right here, we have hourly wages 10, and 10, and for 5, 7, 7, 10. And that's the exact same. So that's for this example of how we can use the quick check see whether it is um, a loss of story. Another observation we have, oh no, we have two observations right here. So that violates the home, and is this loss of story? Yeah. Okay. So there are two observations we have from working through this example. The first one being this. 
let's say if a functional dependency x determines y holds over a relation r and x taking intersection of y is empty, then the decomposition of r into r set difference with y and x, y is lost. You'll be like, what are you talking about? So let's take a look at the example we just worked through right there. So let's map that to here. Here is the x. Okay. We want to say if in function dependency x determines y holds over a relation r. So that will be x being r okay, rating, y being r the ratings. And x taking intersection with y is empty. Is r taking intersection with w empty? If we knew them as set of attributes, then they don't have any attributes overlap, right? Because they are all both single attribute and they're different. So it is empty. Okay, so that one is correct as well. Taking intersection is empty. Then the decomposition of R into R minus Y and XY losses. Here, R minus Y will be the original one. Okay, I'll call this R. Then the original one, minus y, which is w, equals to what? S N L R H. Right? And what is x, y? What is x? R and y is? So that's just R, W. So these are the two decomposition. So it's saying into R taking set difference with Y and X, Y. If we decompose it that way, that's lossless too. So can you see right here? This is exact same as the decompose, decompose R once. And this is exact same as here. You might be wondering why this is true. And that is because if we take a look at here, x, um, the x, which is the r, right, the rating, actually appears in both sides, and it can work as a key for the x, y. Okay, make sense? So these are all the, the ways we can think about when we take a look at the loss of joy. So there's another really interesting thing about lossless join, which is the observation two. So if you take a look at here, we have an original schema R. Let's say we just assume we lossless join decompose into R1 and R2, okay? And we are not satisfied with that, so we don't stop there yet. For this R1, we even further lossless join decompose them into R11 and R12, okay? So if we do it this way, which is decompose this even further, do you think when we look from R all the way to R11, it will also be a lossless join? If we lossless join, lossless join. We won't prove this, but it's also lossless join. Okay. Just draw like a really simple whatever. So yeah, if we take two steps, then from the beginning to the end, it's also lossless. And another interesting thing is that, remember, we say lost the join, then you can recover it back 100% same. So the way you can think about it is when you take just R11 and R12 to recover, they will be able to go back to R1. And if you go back again, R1 and R2 recover, it will go back to R. Okay. So if you want to think of it another way, then it's taking R1, R1, R2, and R2, and then that goes back. So that's for lossless join. Any question for lossless join? Right. So now you know lossless join is basically ensuring when you decompose it, you don't lose any information, and when you recover it, it stays the same. 
So that's the first type of uh, decomposition. The second type I want to talk about will be uh, dependency preserving decomposition. So if you recall, we had this example a few lectures ago when we talked about the contract. And you were asked to, like, given these functional dependencies and how um, you can use the Armstrong axioms to infer more dependencies, right? So that was what we did back then. But now we want to take a look at this and see, do you think it's in voice contract? If contract ID is the key, so C is the key, then do you think it's voice cut normal form? Let's take a look. This one, for sure, that satisfies voice cut normal form, right? Because C is the key. Okay. How about the second one? Do you think? C is not part of JP. So for the first rule, it's out. And for the second rule, JP is not the key. Okay? So this one, out already. So it's not in voice card number four. And if we take a look even further, P is not part of SD. Okay? And is SD a key? No. Okay, out again. So these two violate the voice card number four. So the whole schema is not in voice card number four. And let's, let's say we want to fix the problem caused by this one first, okay? Saying, okay, we see SD determines P makes a not boys called normal form. And ignore this for now. So, yeah, if we say SD is not P, then we can actually decompose it into this way, okay? Let's say this is the original schema, and we decompose them into these two parts. Okay. All right. So if we decompose them into two parts, it's a lossless join, right? Do you guys want to do a quick check, or let's just assume that's lossless join for now? Okay. You can go back to check here. Um, so now we're happy with it. We think, okay, it's good that we fixed the problem where the third one violates the boys' kind normal form. However. We forgot we had a second given functional dependency, right? Where JP determines C. So if you take a look at the, the one you decomposed into, if you want to check whether JP determines C, every time you enter a new tuple, a new data, you actually have to join them all back and check whether that still is valid, right? So if this is what happened, then actually is not is contradicting with the idea we talked about for decomposing to check integrity constraint efficiently. Okay? So such decomposition is not dependency preserving. If we want to make decomposition uh, dependency preserving, let's take a look at what we can do. I'm not sure whether I can finish all of the slides today, but we can try. All right. So here is the definition for a dependency preserving decomposition. Again, I, I repeat here, but I, I'm sure you guys already know, all right, what R is and what F stands for. And when we talk about X and Y, that's what decomposed from R. Okay. <coughs> so before we introduce the definition for a dependency preserving decomposition, let's talk about projection of f on x, what does it mean? Right. So before when we talked about relational algebra, every time we talk about projection, it's selecting the attributes we want. Right. So here it's really similar, um, but it's on the functional dependencies instead. Right. So if we take a projection of functional dependencies on x, then the return will be the set of functional dependencies in the closure that involve only attributes. What do we mean? So we will um, denote it as F subscript X. So if you think of it, it's like we already have um, a set of functional dependencies. And we can infer the closure based on that, right? And today we want to do a projection of F on X, then finding from the closure if both sides 
of the function dependency. Something determines something if both sides include um, the attributes from x set. Then we say it's a projection of f on x. Is that clear? Kind of. So here it's basically saying, note, if we have u determining v in the closure, then it's in the projection of f on x only if all of the attributes, here I put y, I don't know why, but change it to u, right? in u and v on x. To make it a bit clearer, um, I think we can walk through an example. I'll just write down how you can think about this. Uh, graded 